Right. Holy Father in heaven, we bow our heads before you, Father, and we just come before your throne, recognizing you as uh, our God, as the one who is over all, Father, as the one who has all the power. Father, we thank you. We thank you for being our God, for loving us, for including us in your family, Father, for making a way for us to be with you through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for his life, for his a sacrifice, Father, his death on the cross, and uh, for his resurrection, Father, give us hope. Father, we are thankful for this time that we have to come together, study your word, Father. We pray that it brings us more and more enlightenment, and it brings us closer to you, Father, to your son, Jesus, that it unites us closer together uh, as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we uh, pray um, tonight we're, we're, we're lifting up Nathan. Father, as he begins uh, his chemotherapy, Father, we know that we're going to, uh, that's that's hard to go through, Father, it's a long ordeal, and so we pray for strength, for he and his family, Father, we pray that uh, it works, that uh, the, the medicine, the doctors that are working with him, Father, that uh, all goes according to plan, Father, and that he's able to uh, get through this and make a full recovery, Father, is our prayer. Father, we uh, are, are mindful of those that are traveling and not able to be with us. Uh, tonight, Father, we pray for safety on the road. Father, that they're able to rejoin us uh, next lap, Father. And we want to lift up Braylon to you as well. <clears throat> Father, as he is struggling with, with the rash, we know that can be uh, discouraging. Father, that can sometimes you know, be painful and very bothersome. Yeah. Father, we pray that it's nothing major and that uh, they be able to uh, get the treatment he needs for, it to recover, for him to recover, Father. Uh, and just go back to enjoying his childhood, Father. Uh, we just pray that uh, tonight you are glorified in all that we do and all that we say, Father, and that this body of believers is edified uh, through this class, Father. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, yes, my youngest son, Otis, is with us. Uh, he was with me at, the, at work today, and he said, uh, my wife was there, we we're going to head this way. And he said, well, now I'm going to go with you. I said, all right, but I don't think he knew where he was heading. <laughs> he thought I was just going home. So, you know, a long journey. So, um, so we're in uh, misreading scripture, uh, the, the week three, um, four, unit three, week four, uh, I believe. I don't even know. <laughs> and last week, I started off the class, and we'd like to mix things up, keep everybody on their toes. So, I'm going to hand it over to Kirk uh, and let him start the glass and he can go as long as he wants to go and I'll be ready uh, whenever whenever he hands it back over to me. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Kirk. If I, uh... And just to clarify, Kirk Sr., he, he means Kirk Jr. He's, he's not turning it over to you. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to go. Okay. Even though that you would do, of course, you would do a great job if he did. I'm the host, and so uh, let me get a little more room on the screen here, and then I'm going to go ahead. I am going to uh, share the screen. So, uh, it's loud enough but, but I want us to hold off on reading that. <clears throat> uh, so just to make sure we're all on the same page as far as what week we're in, it's actually week five of classes, but it is, Joseph, our, our fourth time to meet together since we were off for Labor Day. But uh, on the syllabus, we are on, on week five. Yeah, so that's already where tonight is a third of the way through the semester. Uh, you might keep in mind one of our sisters that would normally be there in person with you, Della Sell. She uh, emailed that she's on her way to Denver with her granddaughter. Her granddaughter finished her uh, training as a stewardess, and uh, she's on her way to Denver to help her find a, a place to live there with United Airlines. So we can pray uh, God's uh, blessing over them. And then also a reminder to everyone, uh, uh, especially those of us on Zoom, 
Uh, sometimes the internet there at Berean uh, does slow down. And so you will hear it stick or see it stick. Uh, we, I am talking with Dare about if there's a way we can help with a different provider that will give a little faster service. So uh, he is checking into that. And if you, uh, sometimes someone will say they can't hear well or theirs might be sticking when there's no problem on, on uh, Joseph Sander Berean and you just always need to make sure your, your, uh, your volume is turned up. So you saw this, or at least a version of this, uh, for the lesson you looked over this week. I've actually just uh, edited it just a little bit uh, to maybe speak even a little more clearly to us, Richard Rohr. Uh, he just says, those who demand certitude out of life will insist on it, even if it doesn't fit the facts. We've turned faith into, and this is where it differs a little bit from the one in your handout, We've turned faith into a demand for certitude when, in fact, God is saying quite the opposite. You have to live in humility before him who alone knows for certain. I would like to say, and some of us might, might have a scripture pop into mind about this, and we won't stay on this long, but it is important when it comes to reading scripture and sometimes causing us to misread scripture. Uh, our demand for certitude. We think we can be mistaken thinking that our faith demands that we be certain about all of these facts, when in case, when in fact that is not the case. Now, you could think maybe Paul, uh, you might think of him saying, I know. And without looking over the scripture, you might think he said, I know what I believe and I am certain. But he doesn't, he doesn't say, uh, he doesn't state it that way. Let me go. I pulled it up. Uh, <clears throat> can't see it very well there. Second Timothy 1 12. Let me get back over. Uh, uh, oh, this gets in the way of my, uh, We're going to be going to Revelation, but 2 Timothy 1.12. Uh, we're just, there's a lot of versions here. I'm just going to point out this one to you right here in the new NIV. Paul says, my suffering is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he's able to guard what I've been trusted to him until that day. Uh, I think it's important that Paul says here, I know for sure whom I have believed. That is Jesus Christ, son of God. And I'm confident that he is able to keep everything that I that I give over to him. And I bring our attention to that just in case when we, we might object to the fact, well, of course, we're supposed to know for sure what we believe. And, and, and true, I'm not arguing for uh, some irrational ambiguity as if we shouldn't know uh, the Lord, we shouldn't know uh, what he teaches. But as we talk about misreading scripture, we do always have to have that posture of humility before him that, in fact, you and I do not know for certain. You can choose any one of a number of scriptures uh, where it helps us to see we, we do not know the heart and mind of God. Uh, Isaiah 55, 11. Uh, my thoughts are not well before 11. That would really be about beginning in verse 8, 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Uh, we're, we're taught numerous places in scripture. We've got to have that posture of humility before the Lord. And the place that this demand back to this, this demand for certitude, uh, as if there can be no gray 
that there can be no ambiguity. And that's really not the case with Jewish readers and rabbis. They kind of revel uh, in the fact that there is uncertainty and no one of us has the final word on some of these things. Uh, and I just want to issue a, a guard for you. If you have a <clears throat> mind about needing to be, and let's use a stronger term, maybe even one that has a negative connotation, that you've got to be dogmatic or we have to be dogmatic about uh, the things that, that uh, we believe. Hold them firmly, yes, but uh, we can go to, uh, we, we've noted this before, but I'd rather you see it. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Uh, you know, right here, Paul says, I passed on to you what is of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to scripture, that he was buried, raised on the third day according to scripture. And he goes on in verse five, that he was seen, ascended. And so there you have something that's core. You, you have core message. So contrast, not contrast, but now hear Paul in Romans 14. Paul saying, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on his opinions. Uh, so just right there in verse one, there's the core matters, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. Then Paul himself will go on to say here in Romans, don't pass judgment on disputable matters. And so when, as we, as we talk about that issue of certitude, and if you've never given much thought to it, you might be taken aback. And I'm not advocating doubt that we all remain in a state of perpetual doubt. No, even though we need to maybe have an attitude adjustment about doubt. Uh, we can think we kind of are hard on, quote, doubting Thomas, though he's never called that. But in the book of Jude, we're told, be merciful to those who doubt. And if we're brutally honest with ourselves, we will all admit we struggle with doubts at times. And it's okay. It's okay to have those doubts, to have that uncertainty. Now, it's we don't want to just pitch our tent and camp permanently there in uh, a state of constant amb ambiguity, but understand, we need to understand that there is a place for us to hold things loosely with open hands, open palms, uh, instead of clasping in a clenched fist these things that maybe we've heard and believed. Because as we get into the issue of race and ethnicity, here in this chapter, unless we hold things loosely, we're going to simply read out of and act out of some of our uh, prejudices. Uh, so I pray even that brief reflection on some will go further. And, and uh, there, there's the good book that's that's worth reading. That's even called the sin of certainty, because Again, we, we, may not, we may not be used to thinking in those terms, but what I want to keep encouraging us here about reading and misreading scripture, it, there will be, if, if we maintain a posture of dogmatically being right, uh, that we understand it uh, fully as it was intended, uh, then we are much more likely to misread scripture and misapply scripture. Uh, I'll pause there. I don't want to, I want to be able to go on into the topic. I'm going to uh, deal some in scripture first about uh, the issue of race and ethnicity, uh, and then turn it over to, I'll keep an eye on, on the clock here and turn it over to Joseph later. But uh, just on this point, uh, open to input, I've been rather strong or quote, 
certain about this issue of, of certitude. Uh, so I will back off and, and just see if anyone has any response or even disagreement. Uh, Kirk, may I offer Deuteronomy 2929? Um, the written things belong to us. The unwritten things belong to us and our children. And the unwritten things are still the secrets of God. And I think we need to, I think sometimes people play a religion that is, doesn't have any, doesn't have any secrets, in other words. In other words, God God has not told us everything, and we need to be content with what he has told us. And we can be, to a degree, we can be certain about reveal scripture. But even then, sometimes we're not, not, not exactly sure what that means. And, and we can approach scripture almost with a bifocal, with a bifocal approach that says, I will, I will read with certainty but I will read with openness and a willingness to learn and listen. And I think that's, that's as much, that's as important as anything we could say. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That, again, thank you, Kirk. Reframing and stating another way that read with an, an openness. I, I think also of first Corinthians two and what is it about, uh, verse eight, uh, nine uh i need another way uh to pull the spirit searches the deep things of god uh and verse 11 for who the spirit searches the deep things of god for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And so that's where I would emphasize our need for a, a deep humility before the Lord. Because if we come with an attitude of, uh, of we've got it figured out, there's something wrong with that. We're full of self and our own understanding, and there's no room for the spirit. And Paul is clearly telling us here, if, if we're not in a posture of humility to receive to be filled with the spirit of God, uh, then we are not going to be able to know God. Actually, previous Pope stated it uh, in a way that I think is good. Unless we've been touched by the mercy of God, we will really, we will not really know the Lord. And a person who's been touched by the mercy of God is one who has been humbled and who recognizes that our dependence is on him and not on uh, our ability to figure everything out. Uh, Kirk, well, yes. Uh, this Susan, um, yeah. I just want to say, I, I, we've talked about this many times in our Monday night class when we've met in the past, but um, as we learn more, we're amazed of what we don't know and how after reading a scripture that maybe we've read for years, that the spirit opens our eyes to a new meaning and an understanding and the joy of finding out and understanding something new. And then the other thing about it all is the most wonderful thing about the classes, the SHBI classes, is listening to each other as they share what a scripture means to them in their lives. I just feel like that's one of the spirit's greatest things is we learn more about Jesus as the other people in the classes share, or they might share about a scripture and how it, what it meant to them because of their story. And, and for me, I never experienced, I've read that scripture for years, but never thought of it in that way. I just, I just feel like that's the joy of walking this together we will never know it all and i think all of yeah. us have said that the longer we study the more we realize we don't know everything of course we know jesus and that he died for us but but being together and hearing each other speak about him and his goodness in their lives draws us closer to him makes us love the word we learn new things all the time 
things that you and Joseph are teaching us. I mean, all of that is so remarkable. And I, I just, I just want to share that. That's yeah. all. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, honey. Uh, sorry, I almost went past there without letting you share because that is so good. It, it is that you know, stating that we've, we've acknowledged that that's the beauty of studying together. That's the beauty of the body. And we learn, we learn from each other. And it is true. My dad being 90 and still basically having the posture of, uh, he's learned a lot in his years, but he realizes how much he doesn't know. That's part of wisdom. That's part of maturity. Uh, and that, that's part of a Christ-likeness. And uh, so I love, I love that, that you shared that. Uh, so as we as we move into the issue of this chapter race and 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 ethnicity and i'll only give myself like 10 or 15 15 more minutes i think here try to stop joseph at about 6 25 uh to give it to you uh <clears throat> you read it in the book but uh they say we reject this belief and the related implications that some races are morally and intellectually superior to others. Uh, we believe there's only one race, the human race, made in the image of God. Uh, also, uh, they state blanket racial terms such as Caucasian and Black and Latino flatten important distinctions between cultures. Uh, and so, uh, and then he goes down here in Romans 3.23 that they quote Paul and saying, all ethnicities are equal in value. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Or if you go to Colossians 3, what is it about? Is it uh, 12 or so that he goes, for, Paul goes further and saying there is no Jew, Greek, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, male, female. Uh, so, okay, we, we agree with that, but of course that has not been the experience of Christian history. Uh, we all can think of examples or see ways that how we miss, how Christians have misread scripture, misapplied scripture, uh, even on this issue of ethnicity. And I think something they say in here is good, uh, that the point isn't so much to say uh, everybody to be equal, everybody must be the same. There's beautiful differences. Uh, you know, it's not uniformity. Again, that's, that's, I think that's a principle in the kingdom of God. It's not uniformity. Everybody look, you know, they must look, think, smell, act alike. It's unity. It's unity as the human race, but there's all of these beautiful differences. And so I would say, for example, uh, you go to, uh, there may be, I've looked at two or three different uh, ways to pull up various scriptures where I can uh, size it up a little bit. Uh, and uh, there may be a better one than this, but uh, that's what I landed on without, at least where there aren't advertisements showing you dresses and stuff that you can buy while we're looking at scripture so uh it went not where i wanted it to revelation five nine so <clears throat> here in revelation five nine they sang a new song saying <clears throat> You, <clears throat> excuse me, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. And uh, I just, even that part of the, <clears throat> this, that part of the verse right there, every tribe and language and people and nation is used. I think it's a, at least five times in the book of Revelation. And so the writer is acknowledging, yeah, there's a beautiful diversity. If I would have pulled it up earlier, I would show you this, <clears throat> this graphic of Jesus's robe. <clears throat> Excuse me, clear up in a second. Jesus's robe 
of many colors, kind of like Joseph's, Joseph's coat of many colors, but Jesus's robe of nations. And it takes all of these colors, all of this diversity to give, to bring God all of the glory that he deserves. So we don't try to flatten everything and everyone and say, we're all the same. No, that there is a, a diversity that makes the body richer. So, you know, it's not uniformity that we're looking for when we talk about ethnicities and, and saying they make the good point in there that ethnicity is a better term than race. Race kind of flattens all of the differences. You take Latino and well, that, in, that embraces literally, you know, a hundred different cultures or more Latino cultures. And so ethnicities does a better job. Uh, so how are some of the ways that, you know, historically we've misread scripture, Christians have and used it uh, to justify uh, what they want to do? Well, of course, we can all think of uh, justifying the slave trade. And, you know, there's a very poor, a very bad, wrong reading of uh you know genesis that historically uh people christians used to justify slave trade if you go to genesis uh, and you can be looking at these yourself but it's nine and is it about verse eight <clears throat> pull that up Nine, nine. Nope, back up. Sorry, I am there. We need first. Oh, sorry. I need to be way over at verse uh, 24. So after he comes off the ark and he gets drunk on wine, of course. Uh, it mentions Ham going into the tent and seeing him naked, and he goes out and tells his brothers, and uh, uh, then uh, Shem and Japheth walk in backwards and cover their father. Noah awakes. When he awoke from, and, and historically it's been said that here, you know, it's where, uh, you know, there are cursed races, but a total misreading and misapplication of, of scriptures. He awoke and saw what his son had done. He said, cursed be Canaan. Now it was Ham that saw him, but it seems in some way Canaan, one of his sons was involved, cursed be Canaan. The lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. Well, isn't it interesting there? Uh, Canaan was the father of the Canaanites, Amorites, the Hittites, all of those that uh, the Israelites would, would have conflict with when they went into the land. Uh, nothing said there. And if we need a reminder about uh, his other sons, uh, if you went over to Genesis 10, uh, verse 6, There you have the sons of Ham, are who, Cush, Egypt, Put, Canaan. Canaanites going more up into, uh, you know, what is into Judea, Canaan at the time. Cush uh, would be like the Ethiopians, the Egyptians, or Misrium. Another version might read Misrium. When we're learning Swahili, there's a lot of Arabic root in Swahili and that they mystery was Egypt and one of the bigger versions will say Misriam or Egypt. Uh, so no, here are the darker skinned ones. They're not involved in they're not a par part of this curse. Uh, and yet for even centuries Christians took misapplied, misread scripture, justifying uh, you know, their 
their end game, what they wanted out of it, that is uh, to enslave another group of people and force them to do slave labor in order to enrich themselves. Uh, and of course, there's, there's more in scripture. Joseph is gonna spend some time uh, in the book of Acts and some of the examples they brought out uh, of some of the issues of ethnicity that we see uh, in Acts. Uh, but you can go even to uh, the book of Luke. And Luke, because he wrote the gospel of Luke, you know, you can kind of talk about uh, the two volumes of Luke. Uh, Luke volume one is the gospel according to Luke and uh, Luke volume two is the book of Acts. And even as Luke notes ethnicities in uh, the book of Acts, he notes some of those differences in his own. And why uh, Luke, you know, and to a degree is kind of as far as we know is the, the only Gentile writer. Uh, he's a Gentile. He was a, a doctor according to history. Uh, and he knew what it was like to be uh, what uh, discriminated against. And so he had a, a, a soft spot for those who tend to get marginalized. And so Luke draws a lot of attention uh, in his gospel to women. Uh, and uh, then we'll see you know, what he does in the book of Acts. Uh, so, and he's not the only reader, of course, the only writer uh, to help sensitize us to this. And, and we'll, we can see all of this and agree, but still where the rubber meets the road is that we have a hard time, even when we can see in scripture, there is no basis for prejudices or uh, you know, looking down our nose at others, we we will find ourselves doing it. And and there's this is some version of what uh, one teacher said. Maybe the most dangerous prejudice is uh, is the one who feels he or she is not prejudiced at all. Uh, if we're honest with ourselves, we will acknowledge we come to the table uh, with some preconceived ideas about people. Uh, but uh, let me look at one more verse that uh, probably won't come up. We were at Romans 14, and I think it's going to be at about verse. That's the only disadvantage to this one. I have another one that pulls up a lot of scriptures. You just can't, uh, you just can't see see it as well, or I can't enlarge it. Uh, uh, probably four. Let me go to Romans 14, verse four. Uh, so here we are. We come with some of our ingrained prejudices one way or the other based on ethnicities and economic standards of people. And Paul says after he says in verse one, don't don't pass judgment on disputable matters. He says, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. But I just want us to see something about the heart of God there. The Lord is able to make them stand. That's God's desire. We don't, we don't have a God who looks for ways to trip people up, to catch them unawares. We have a God who loves to see people stand, who loves to see people do well, who loves to show mercy. And, and we don't take from this, of course, it's, it's, there's all kinds of political correctness associated with, you know, don't judge, who are you to judge me? And so we need to, we need to hear what Paul says, that's right. We are not to judge someone else's servant. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't speak the truth in love, that we don't go to someone who is struggling with sin. Uh, no, we still have all these other scriptures that we bring to bear. But when we come with our prejudices, whether they're ethnically based or they're based on uh, church backgrounds, 
or economic backgrounds. We have all of these unspoken things that we take for granted that go without being said. And unless we recognize them when we come to reading scripture, uh, we are going to misread it or we will maybe even teach what we believe that it says, but we don't, we don't apply that. We don't really live it out uh, in our lives by uh, having some serious checks and balances on our own attitudes. I'll pause there uh, on uh, any of these re scriptures that we've reflected on, uh, or if you have another thought, even on one that we haven't, uh, any any feedback or thoughts about this uh, here but transition as we uh, get ready to turn it over to Joseph. And then if you still have some time at the end, we can come back with joint discussion, uh, Joseph. But uh, any any other thoughts there from? Yeah, I have another question. Yeah. Uh, and we were starting off this conversation, we were talking about the core message of scripture and the core message of the Bible and the core message of Jesus Christ, which I thought was very important. And I, and I can understand the scripture that we bring forth concerning reading scripture and impact on ethnicity and race, all that, all of that. And I get that. But the core message to me, this is my opinion, as I observe the difficulty that Christians and uh, the Old Testament, New Testament, about race and ethnicity in the Bible, is that at the core root of it is that it's Satan. Okay, this is what. He wants, because the Bible tells us, Scripture tells us that he is the author of confusion. Okay, so when we look at Scripture, we know that the core message of the covenant through Jesus Christ in faith is that the basic one, the number one one, is do unto others as you have them do unto you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if the when we as Christians make that our emphasis when reading scripture, I don't think we have all these problems that we have in trying to ascertain what scripture says about race and what scripture says about ethnicity and what it says about color and he meant this instead of he meant that he didn't mean this and he didn't mean that. But that's the job it all to as I look at scripture, all this transpired. Due to the fall, because when the first fall of man, because when God created the heavens and earth, He created a perfect situation for man until sin entered, okay, which was mastered by Satan. And we know through scripture that Satan is the prince of the earth. So that is his job, is to, as the Bible says, put forth chaos and confusion. And so through his mechanisms, this is what his core is, okay? But Jesus' core, okay, is different. But for some reason, we don't want to deal with the core message of scripture or the core mm -hmm. message of the Bible, which is the love of your, uh, love your God, your Lord, all your heart, all your soul, all your body, all your mind. And it really creates yeah. this thing. And the number one scripture, is to what? Do unto others that you would have them do unto Yeah. No, so that's, that's good. Another, that's another offshoot from reading yeah. it. Uh, and at the office, he's trying to, you know, make things right and get us an understanding. But he's trying to me, and I don't call him for it because it's very good information and reading it, and I'm intrigued by it. But we keep continuing to perpetuate this stuff. Okay. Yeah. Uh, race, ethnic, and culture. Instead of lifting up the core message of Christ. Right. And so, you know, I think that we as Christians, when we're dealing with folks, 
when these districts come into our court, that our response, instead of maybe trying to have quote unquote be allowed to go academic arguments about what he meant or what he didn't mean, or what it was the yeah. other way that was, is that, is that hey, above all of that, we have to lift ourselves higher and not deal on that level because these are a lot of times we deal with people's worldly views, flesh driven by the flesh, and not driven by the faith, and not driven yeah. by the Holy Spirit, and on and on and on and on. Yeah. No, that's good, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. I mean, yeah, uh, you, you take Matthew, you know, Sermon on the Mount there, uh, as you noted, should be our ultimate guide for everything. Treat people the way that we want to be treated or Jesus's statement, you know, his summary statement of the law and Matthew 22, 35 through 37, love, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, if if we would do that, yes, that uh, that that provides the umbrella for all of our understanding of Scripture. Uh, but you leave it to us as humans, and we love to, you know, support our own positions and prejudices, and so we will we can misread things in order to do that. But I appreciate you how you bring in that that big overarching picture into mind because that's what truly should guide us. Uh, Joseph, I will turn it over, uh, back over uh, to you. All right. And um, I don't know, is this Susan's hand up on this? Is that what that is? Uh, I think that was from earlier. Uh, okay. Or no, and then Marcus, I like what you had to say uh, because I think it was either, I think it was last week, might have been two weeks ago or three weeks ago, um, where one of our tools what can help keep us from misreading scripture is interpreting things through the eyes of Jesus. And that's exactly what you were saying there is, you know, yeah. uh, I'm going to read this. Of course, it, it can help us understand certain things when we're reading and they know, Hey, this person was from this country and it can help us understand why someone might've reacted in a certain way. And we can see that, uh, but ultimately in how our reaction to things and how we treat others Definitely, right? And especially within the new context of New Testament, um, which is kind of what I'm going to hit on here as I go um, with uh, this idea. And, you know, in, in the book, he does, of course, I don't want to kind of repeat too much of where I'm not going to really hit on much of all other than a little bit from First Corinthians, what the author hit on in the book. So I know you guys can all read it and, and get that, but I will allow me to step out of the teacher role into the preacher role just a little bit. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, but uh, I want us to look at a, a couple of things. One, uh, because as we can read this and we can get this and, you know, intellectually, we can understand, you know, but honestly, when we look out over the United States of America and maybe other places, I don't know, I haven't been too many places in the world, I'm not seeing it lived out, you know, and that's bothersome, that's troublesome uh, to me and I know to, to a lot of people. Um, so let me uh, get my bearings here. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Righty. And I've got a few scriptures here. Uh, this is not really anything too new as far as what Jesus was all about, right? As, as, uh, in his preaching, of course, he goes to the Jews, he is a Jew. Uh, but even, you know, here I would have on this board here, Matthew chapter 8, 10 through 12, when Jesus heard, uh, and, and well, I mean, I'll go to, I'll go to Luke. So he kind of said it in two different gospels. He said that once uh, in Luke, when he's talking to the faith of the centurion, um, he's amazed at his faith and he was not a Jew, right? And then later when he's talking about uh, entering through the narrow door, he says, uh, uh, I thought I hit it, I think I did, in Luke. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the great, you know, uh, Jewish leaders, uh, patriarchs. You see all them and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out because it's not based on who your parents were, right? Because people will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. And they would have understood his listeners. Those are those people that are not Jews, 
are not children of Abraham. Those are Gentiles, is who he's talking about. So when G, this idea of, that we're, we're going to get to the book of Acts, that, hey, this message goes out to all people around the world. This It's in the prophets. It's in the Old Testament. Jesus himself uh, says it. And so uh, with that, I want us to go to Acts. So we'll be in Acts for a minute. So get your Bibles going. We're going to flip through here and, and cover a lot of ground. Um, and uh, if I start to get close to my time, sir, let me know. All right. uh, and so here we go. You got these these blue collar workers. You got some uh, some zealots uh, who would have been extremely opposed to the Roman government. You got um, some some tax collectors who would have been working for the Roman government. But all of these Jewish men. Uh, who have been walking and talking and learning from Jesus, and now they've seen him die on the cross, and they've seen the resurrected Jesus. Uh, and in Matthew 28, you get the Great Commission. And then in Acts, you know, which Luke wrote, uh, verse 8, kind of uh, not necessarily the Great Commission, but it's alluded to here. Uh, chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 8. Mm -hmm. He tells them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, They'd have no problem with that, right? And Judea, okay, yeah, we're, we're not even from Jerusalem. We're from the northern part, right? Most of them, anyway. And Samaria, oh, man, Samaria again, like where we had to go and talk to that woman at the well, and well, we had to go there and get this. And to the ends of the earth, you guys are going to have to do this. You are going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, is what he tells them, right? All right, so... We get the story of Acts. We get the we get uh, the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit coming. We have Peter's sermon. We get the church growing in Jerusalem. Right. So flip over with me to chapter six. We get we got a great picture in Acts chapter two of the church and everybody unified and working together and studying scripture and nobody's hungry and they're eating together. And it's beautiful. And then we get to chapter six and we got a little bit of a problem. Right. Start to creep its head here. Verse six, chapter 6, verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. We got a problem based on ethnicity early on in the church. They're in Jerusalem, the Hebraic Jews, maybe a little more traditional, speaking the language. There's a lot more of them around here. They're getting preferential treatment. And our, our widows, our Grecian widows, uh, still Jews, but maybe they don't speak the Aramaic, right? They're speaking uh, Greek. They're, they're not getting treated the same way. There's a problem. And it's based on, again, not race, but ethnicity, right? Uh, maybe language, these types of things. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together, and they got to figure this out. They say, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. Notice the, uh, the qualifier there, full of the Spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them, and we'll give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And so a list here, right? The proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. He's going to lose his life in a couple chapters. Uh, also, Philip. Procurus, I don't know how to say these names, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert, a convert to Judaism. All of these names are Greek names. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they all were Greek. There could have been a couple of uh, uh, Hebraic Jews, just maybe Luke translates their names and, you know, to make it sound more Greek, but they're Greek names. These, they would have... You know, they didn't say, okay, well, we're going to, there's more Aramaic Jews or uh, Hebraic Jews here. We're going to use them and install them. They wanted, they're, they they were paying attention to this, right? It was based on, yes, who was full of the spirit, but recognizing the need to have people in position of leadership. Uh, it didn't really matter so much about, uh, uh, you know, what their background might have been or anything, but also, Maybe seeing wisdom in the fact that, hey, it's good if we are diverse in our leadership as well. Surely the 12 apostles noticed they all probably came, most of them from similar places, similar backgrounds. Yes, they might have had some different thoughts on things, uh, but they install, they still all Jewish people, but maybe with a different background, right? Maybe they speak the, the language that was needed. And even notice Nicholas, 
a convert to Judaism. He's from Antioch. Antioch is a Gentile city. He converted to Judaism. He wasn't even a Jew originally. This is the first that we have in Scripture, the first non-Jew Christian. Now, he was fully converted to Judaism. Right? He was a proselyte. He was, you know, he was a Jew through conversion, but it wasn't his, uh, his full background. All right, so that that's the that's the kind of their solution to that, right? All right, so pretty pretty big uh, change though that we see happen in the church here. Uh, and then let's skip over to uh, chapter eight. Stephen's been, you know, he gives his great speech in chapter seven, uh, and then he's stoned to death, right? Of course, Paul being there, uh, giving his approval for this. Go with me to uh, midway verse one, a. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Now, what did Jesus tell the apostles? When the Holy Spirit, when you receive the gift, stay here in Jerusalem, but when you receive the gift, what? You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. They got that down. That's where they're at. Judea, Samaria, it branches out. It's further and further until the ends of the earth. Now, here, the apostles, they don't go out to the ends of the earth. They stay in Jerusalem. Uh, they will, not too long after that, start branching out. But they're in Jerusalem, but it's, the, it's, the, it's uh, the disciples, right? It's the others that are following Jesus. They go out into, uh, they're, they're spreading out. And as they go, they're taking the message with them. And so look what Luke does in Acts, right? And this is, you know, this idea of misreading scripture. And this, I'm teaching this lesson here specifically chose this because of my own misreading scripture. Not necessarily, I would say misreading, just maybe missing something as I read through the book of Acts. Kind of having this mindset of like going out and preaching the gospel, going to the ends of the earth. Um, it, it just, I guess, um, you kind of just take for granted that, you know, we have a history in, in, in church history of that when you go somewhere and you convert people, you don't just convert them to Christ, you convert them to your way of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so even to this day, you can go to certain parts of the world. Uh, they may not speak, uh, you know, our language or, or anything, but it's almost like you're stepping into a church from the 1940s or 50s in America, and it's in some jungle somewhere or some wilderness. Has nothing, and you feel like you're stepping into an American church because we took not just the gospel, but our way of doing things as well. Because we think, you know, we want to convert people to our way, not just our Savior. And as you read through this and you realize what they were stepping into, for one, would have been very uncomfortable for them, uh, especially in the beginning. Uh, but I, there's a lesson there for us that I personally missed a lot. So here we are in chapter eight, the scattering, right? And, and so let's go through this. Uh, Philip goes where? Samaria. Half Jews, half anything else, all right? A bunch of uh, uh, mixed uh, uh, races, mixed ethnicities in there. And so he goes and he's proclaiming the word and people are believing. People are believing, right? But still, mainly all Jews. Then we get down to verse 9, uh, and we have a, a Simon the sorcerer. Now, I'm bringing this up. This is not necessarily a, a race or an ethnicity thing, but it's someone who, let's look at how they describe him. Verse 9. Simon practiced sorcery. He amazed all the people. He boasted that he was someone great. They said about him uh, in verse 10, this man is the divine power known as the great power. Verse 11 says he used magic. And I'm bringing all this up because if I were to encounter someone like that in this day and age, this isn't necessarily an ethnic or cultural thing, I would think that person... They're not, they're not going to hear the gospel, right? They themselves think they're divine. <clears throat> Sometimes, I don't know about you, if you go to flea markets or farmer's markets, you see more and more now uh, people selling crystals and things like this. And it's, you know, it's witchcraft and it's uh, demon worship and things like this. And in my head, I'll admit, I think they, they can't receive the gospel. And I come to the book of Acts and I read why they're telling us specifically about this sorcerer. Go down to verse 13. Simon himself believed and was baptized. Now, he's going to make a mistake and try to buy the Holy Spirit. And they're going to get on to him and say, you're going to perish if you do that. You go down to verse 24. 
He answers, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen. The Jews are not just going branching out to different groups, different ethnicities, but also people who don't even really believe in God at all in the same way they do. Non-Jew, as far as religion-wise, right? Uh, so let's keep going now. Still in chapter 8. Get down to verse 26. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem down to Gaza. So he started out on his way, and look who he meets, an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Now, this is not a Jew. Now, this man himself, more likely coming from Jerusalem, reading from the scroll of Isaiah, probably was a convert to Judaism himself, right? But he's going to a foreign country, and he, he's you know, at least foreign from their standpoint, right? His home country, and he's going to take with him the gospel message of Jesus Christ. How did Philip feel about this when he encountered this man? You know, it's interesting. I don't think uh, we might make a big to do about the fact that it's probably a different race, more than likely. But Philip probably didn't. He probably saw a Jew. His color, maybe not, he didn't look at. It. Maybe he looked at what he believed. The fact that he's reading Isaiah, he may not have had a bigger problem than we think he would based on outward appearance, but maybe more so on, on his belief, right? But still, regardless of all that, it is a difference of, of ethnicity, a difference of, of race going on here. And so, he, of course, this, this man uh, believes and they're, they're baptized. Look at what he says in verse 36. Hey, here's some water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Wow, what an amazing question. Why shouldn't I be baptized? It's, it's not about what we think someone, where they may be, right? Who they may be or anything like that. What's keeping me from being baptized? And the answer, of course, is nothing. And what's going to come to Philip's? head and the rest of the apostles eventually is what's keeping anyone from being baptized all these walls that they have put up what's keep nothing is keeping them from being baptized right then we go through chapter nine saul's conversion an enemy of christ uh can you imagine uh having to be uh ananias hey ananias god tells us, go talk to paul you mean the guy who came here to arrest all of us right that's a barrier that has to be broken down but look at, look at what he tells uh, Ananias in verse 15, chapter 9. The Lord said to Ananias, go, this man, this Jewish man, steeped in Judaism, a Pharisee, right? Uh, not only is he opposed to everyone other than Jews, he himself, like Christianity, which at that time still would have been a sect of Judaism, he is adamantly opposed to them up until he meets Jesus. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles. The last person on earth, you would think, to go before the Gentiles. That's who God's going to use. God sees things way differently than we do, fortunately. To the Gentiles and their kings, and also before the people of Israel. Let's keep going. I'm, I'm getting somewhere with all of this. Eventually. <laughs> um, for chapter 10. Then we got the big one. All right, the big one. It's no longer just for Jews anymore in chapter 10. Verse 1, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. Look at him, a centurion, what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout, and they're God-fearing, but they are not Jews. They have not converted to Judaism. When you read God-fearing in the Bible, it means they believe in God, they appreciate God, they're trying to... to to live how he wants, they help the poor, you know, they may pray to them, but they themselves, they can't go into the inner courts of the temple, they've not been circumcised, right, they're not full converts to Judaism, they just appreciate it and, and follow it without being converts, that's what a God-fearing person is in the book of Acts, uh, <clears throat> but uh, someone approaches, right, one day about three in the afternoon, chapter, or verse three, he had a vision, he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, and he says, your prayer, your gifts to the poor, they've come up, I'm going to send for you to go get Simon, so that, that's what happened, and then you got Peter on the other end of it, all right, so go with me down to uh, uh, verse 15, so so Peter's in, in Joppa, uh, and uh, he's up on the roof, he's hungry, he's getting ready to eat, but he falls asleep, the Bible says he goes into a trance, and uh, he sees this, this, this blanket, this large sheet lower down to the earth by its four corners. And he hears a voice that says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. 
He says in verse 14, surely not, Lord. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Now, you can imagine, uh, you know, Peter's going to interpret this eventually. He's going he's to start to get it that he's not talking necessarily about food anymore. He's talking about people, right? right. Um, and so, but still, when he goes back and tells the, the other Jews, hey, you know, these Gentiles, we, they receive the Holy Spirit, they're going to be like, what are you doing hanging out with them? You can't do that. He's going to tell them about the dream. This would have been a hard, this would have been totally opposed to everything he would have been told, right? What made them clean? What made these non-Jewish people clean in the sense that you can come in contact with them and not become impure and not go before God? What was it? Were they always like that and they just missed the point? Was the law wrong? No, it said Jesus died for them. Right? Jesus makes them clean. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. Uh, you know, for all the verses out there, the scriptures out there about uh, race or anything like this or, or any difference between any of us, right? If God makes someone clean, including me, <laughs> that's, all I, that's all I need to hear, right? I like in verse 17, Peter's wondering about the meaning of this. This is mind-blowing to him. What's, what is this talking about? Are we talking about just food here, right? Uh, he's wondering about it in verse 17. Verse 19, he's still thinking about it. He's trying to figure it out. And then he is, because the next day he's going to go to Cornelius' house. Skip, skip down with me uh, to uh, verse 25, chapter 10, verse 25. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter, I love this, made him get up. Stand up, he said, I'm only a man myself. I love that humility, right? Verse 27, talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. Cornelius invited all his family and his friends to the house for this. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. It was against their law, the law of Moses. But that's just not a religious law. I mean, it is, but it's a law of the land also. Right? That is their law of the land. It's against the law. For him to do what he is doing. He's breaking the law to honor the words of God. He said, but God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. I asked why you sent for me. And he tells it, uh, you know, tells him the vision that he saw. Go down to verse 34. When Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. I'm still getting somewhere, but I want to pause because you might think, well, how does this do with misreading scripture? And again, I'm speaking from my own experience, right? That uh, it, it is common and it, it is, we get it, right? We get this understanding that it's not just the message goes out to all people, but these are huge differences, gigantic differences that the apostles you know, would have to overcome and come to this understanding that God, that Jesus died for every person. And it's simple. We get it, right? Well, we don't seem to be getting it. It's a problem. Uh, hey, Joseph, real, real quickly, you just, uh, just heads up about five more minutes. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, five more minutes. Um, chapter 11. Go to chapter 11 with me real quick. They're really starting to get it now. In chapter 11, the church uh, gets to Antioch. And Antioch is a Gentile city. Yes, there are Jews there. It's a bad city. It's known for its, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a bad place, right? Uh, and uh, look at verse 20. Well, actually, uh, let's go to verse uh, 19. Those who had scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news. So people start to uh, uh, be, become Christians who are not Jews. Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead because of time. Um, Antioch itself starts to send out missionaries, Paul, right, Barnabas, they get sent out. Not only that, go down to... Um, is God helping? God's understanding where the Jews are at with this, the Christian Jews. He's helping them. Go down to verse 29. A famine hits the Roman Empire. People in Judea 
are having problems. Look at verse 29. The disciples, this is in Antioch, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. So Jerusalem, where the church started, is receiving help from the church in a Gentile city made up of Gentiles as well. God's helping them along this path of understanding this. Okay. Um, and there's some other, other good things I want to look at. Go to verse 13. I thought this was real neat, and then we'll, we'll jump to 1 Corinthians real quick. Um, chapter, chapter 13, I'm sorry, not verse 13, chapter 13. Uh, there's prophets and teachers there, okay? The church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, we know about Barnabas. Simeon called Niger. Niger means black. That's just what it means. Now, was he black? I don't know. They call him that because he wore black clothes. We don't know why they call him that, but it's interesting to point out, right? Simeon called Niger. They called him black for some reason or another. Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene is a city in northern Africa. Does that mean that Lucius was black? We don't know. We don't know what he was, but we know he wasn't from, you know, he was from North Africa. Uh, and then a man named Manian, who'd been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, been brought up with, maybe he was related to somehow, maybe he was a childhood friend. That, yeah, this is the Herod that had John the Baptist killed. This is Herod that Jesus stood in front of when he was on trial. This guy grew up with him, or somehow was related to him, and he's either a prophet or a teacher. That's huge, how we look at people, right? Okay, skip over now to 1 Corinthians. See if I can do this real quick. I'm getting, I'm getting, getting, getting to a, got a point here, got a point here. This is the church early on. This is what it's supposed to look at. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter your background, right? God is for all people. And then you get to 1 Corinthians and Paul writes to them in chapter one, he says, uh, he says in, in verse uh, 10, there shouldn't be any division among you. No division. There should be no division among you. A lot of times we misread this, like the book talked about, to think he's talking theological. Any of that is included, right? You should be completely united in mind and thought. My brother, some from Chloe's household have informed me that you are there are cores among you. What I mean is some say I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, and still another I follow Christ. Paul, a resident of Rome, right? Educated. Uh, maybe the, 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 the Jews that were citizens of Rome, maybe they got behind Paul because they could understand that. They were proud of their, their uh, Roman citizenship. citizenship. Apollos was a Jew, but he was from Egypt. Alexander, he was from Egypt. So maybe there's Alexandrian Jews living there, which by the way, uh, Corinth is an extremely diverse port city, right? So there's people from all over there. Uh, Cephas is Peter, and he uses uh, Peter's uh, Aramaic name there. Maybe there are Palestinian Jews living there, and so they kind of go, and so there seems to be division among them based on their culture, based on their ethnicity within the church. I'm glad we don't have that anymore today, do we? <laughs> I'm ending on this, right? Jesus said it's for all people. All, everyone from all over the earth are going to go sit at the table, right? Uh, the apostles started out that way. They got it. Maybe they struggled a little bit, but they got it. Paul's telling them, don't divide. Don't divide. And here we are. We read this and we laugh. and we're like, oh, yeah, People don't get it. And yet every day, like Martin Luther King said, the most segregated hour in America is Sunday morning, right? Uh, I got one thing I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, it's a constant fight. This is a constant battle. It has been starting in Acts chapter 6 in the very beginning of the church in Corinthians, right, when Paul's writing them. Because naturally, we don't want to unite. We want to be like the Tower of Babel. You, you're like me? All right, let's go over here. Y'all go over there. Isn't it funny how God used language to divide people? And in the book of Acts, he uses language, to, different languages to bring people together. We may be different, and we got to accept that, but we need to accept Jesus. I'm going to show this, and I'll be done, Kirk. I know. <laughs> this is, I'm picking on one place, but this is all over the United States of America. I got on Google Maps, this is Macon, Georgia. This is uh, First Baptist Church in Macon, Georgia. And I'm not picking on them, just using that because it's an extreme example. First Baptist Church in Macon, Georgia. Nice building. A very similar building. This is First Baptist Church in Macon, Georgia. All right, so First Baptist Church in Macon, Georgia. First Baptist Church in Macon, Georgia. If you wanted to know how to get from one to the other, you go to MapQuest or Google Maps, and you can say, well, if I follow the streets, it takes me three minutes walking to get from one church, one First Baptist church to the next. If I cut across, it'd probably take me about a minute. 
They're right next door to each other. At one point in time, they worshiped together. The white folks were down front, the black folks were up in the back. Somewhere around the end of slavery, the, so okay, the black folks gonna have their own church, and so they built one right there. And they've been segregated ever since. In their defense, recently they have tried to come together for some things, but they still uh, worship separately on Sunday morning. And I'm just picking on them, but this is all over America. Let me, uh, oh man. One more picture. So you could, if you wanted to, can't get rid of this thing. I ah, can't get that thing out of the way. I don't know how to do that. Uh, if you wanted to, well, you can stand <laughs> at the corner and at a Catholic church, and you can look right here and you can see First Baptist Church. You can actually First Baptist Church and decide which one you want to go to. All right. They're they're that close. And it's sad. It's extremely sad. I'm not what what I'm saying is probably every single one of us are in a similar situation. We just, all right, they, about 80% of all Christians go to a church that in which they are like 80% of the people in that building. That's the way it is. It's a constant fight that we constantly have to be going up against. We, we divide ourselves. It's, it's sad. Uh, so I'm picking on not that church. I'm picking on the church, all of us, because in the United States of America, at least we're all extremely guilty of this. And we got to do better because what is just like if I could show you this picture, I wish I could. Just like we can stand there on Google Maps and I can look at two churches and say, and that's just terrible. What do you think the rest of the world is doing when they look at look at us? We're, we're making that same division. All right, I know I went over, Kurt. We gotta start the next class. Yeah, so. no problem. Yeah, just when I do start it up, it will uh, shut this one down. So I uh, don't wanna do that to y'all, but very good, good thoughts. Uh, Love the the study in scripture there, Joseph. So, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. just just you know, as, as we're convicted about teaching people the gospel, I think that's part of it. You know, seeing the the difference in the races and the ethnicities and all that, and, and letting that convict us just the same. I don't allow those people just like myself. I tell you what, let's let's do sometime. Let's talk about Colossians because all of <laughs> the book of Colossians is people. Who had already obeyed the gospel, but they were mixed up with circumcision. They were mixed up with uh, magic. They were mixed up with fortune tellers and all kinds of things like that. So, how does that work? That you have a church at Colossae that is just a heretical out the left ear, kind of. And so, what are we going to do there? How do we how do we go about? How would we do if we were members at, at Colossae? Because that is, a, that is an amazing church. That was my first course at South Houston Bible Institute. Uh, what about this church at Colossae and, and, that, and the cultural mores that are coming up through the, filtering up through their Christianity? Whoa, it would really be something at Colossae. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and Paul does a good job there of, uh, you know, helping them to see, yeah, what unites them is Jesus Christ. But that's a good point there, Kurt. Well, uh, good, good study. I know we have to end it. I've got to start the other one. So uh, goodbye until we meet again next week. And two weeks from the, tonight, Susan, I'll be back there with you in person. So great uh, class. Goodbye for now. Good night, good night. everyone. Good night. You got me so stirred up. I don't know.